Hello, I want to talk about calculations of slope, practicing that, and uh, discussing the results of our first experiment. So if I want to find the slope of a graph, and here I have a position versus time graph, and I'm using x for position, like we're learning in our uh, reading assignment this week, x for horizontal positions. I also use y for vertical positions, but we don't need to deal with that just yet. Um, but this also brings up an important point to me about the language of math versus the language of physics. Because x, in math, x is whatever's going on your horizontal axis. x is our independent variable when we're talking in the language of math. But when we're talking in the language of physics, I'm using x to represent position. And since position is my dependent variable here, um, then I end up putting x on this vertical axis. And if we're not careful about our thinking, then that could be really confusing. Um, like a really confusing statement and a really confusing question is like, why did you put x on the y-axis? But the problem with that question that I just asked is that I switched language halfway through the sentence. Um, I was talking about x in terms of position, and then I was talking about y in terms of math language, and, and that can confuse. So we just want to be careful about thinking, am I talking math talk? x and y mean independent variable, dependent variable. Am I talking physics talk? x means position. And so that's just something for us to always be mindful of. And I color coded here on the screen. So if I'm calculating slope, I need to take two points from my line. And so I'm doing a rise divided by a run. Um, in that's language you learn in math class. The rise is the change vertically. So in math language, those are the y's, the run, in is the x's and we subtract the later one minus the earlier one so we're doing the second one minus the first one and that order really matters so first i'm going to pick out two points on my graph and this graph i've got two really simple points that i can choose i'm starting here at zero seconds at 80 centimeters and also I'm crossing that time axis right at four seconds, I'm at zero centimeters. And so those are two nice, easy numbers to use. So why not use simpler numbers if I'm calculating my slope? So in green here, rise over run, y2 is the second y value, y1 is that first y value divided by x2 is this second x value divided minus x1, the first x value. But I don't want to think math. I want to think physics. And so here in blue, position 2 minus position 1, rise over run, I'm going down from 80 centimeters to 0 centimeters. So position 2 minus position 1 is 0 centimeters minus 80 centimeters. The run in physics language, I'm looking at a difference in times, time two minus time one. So I'm doing four seconds minus zero seconds. So doing that math, then calculating my slope, I get zero centimeters minus 80 centimeters. The order is important there, divided by four seconds minus zero seconds. I'm doing the second number minus the first number. And so I get negative 80 centimeters divided by four seconds, and that divides down to 20 centimeters divided by one second. So the meaning of that slope, to just say that the slope is negative 20 centimeters over one second, might not be immediately obvious. What does that mean for me? But if we think about this in terms of a for every statement, then that's saying that for every one second that the car drives, it will go down on our number line by 20 centimeters. It will move backwards. It'll move to the left by 20 centimeters. Since our number line had increasing numbers to the right, then going to a lower position is going to the left. So for every second the car drives, it goes 20 centimeters to the left. Now that 
slope sounds to me like it has some meaning. For every one increment of time, here's how far I'm going to go. Now, the sign also is important. The sign, a downward sloping line, tells us that we're moving backwards on our number line. An upward sloping line, some groups have lines that sloped upwards, like so. And an upward sloping line would be showing going to higher and higher and higher positions, and that would match up with moving to the right. So the sign of our slope tells us the direction. Was it moving left or was it moving right? Moving left, we get a negative slope. Moving right, we get a positive slope. The number for the slope tells us how fast the car is. For every second, I go 20 centimeters. If I had another line, say, that started side by side with this car, but had a steeper graph, then in one second, this car travels a larger distance. This car would go in those same four seconds, instead of going backwards by 80 centimeters, would have gone backwards by 120 centimeters. And so if this car goes more centimeters in the same amount of time, then that car must be faster. So the amount of the slope tells us how fast. The sign of the slope tells us which direction. And so the, the speed we could think of as like the absolute value of that slope where we don't pay attention to the positive or negative sign. Um, talking similarly about speeds in this way, the speed limit on my way to school this morning was for every one hour that you drive, you'll go 35 miles. Now, you don't actually have to drive for a whole hour, but that's what the ratio is. Just like this ratio here, for each one second, you go back by 20 centimeters. The car could have stopped before a full second passed. The car could go for more than one second. But this is just a ratio saying that for each one of the denominator, here's how many you'll get of the numerator. So thinking about a speed with that for every language, for every one hour that I travel, then I go 35 miles an hour. For every one hour that I travel, I'll get on the highway, I go 65 miles. So that's our meaning of the slope. Also, thinking about the y-intercept, the y-intercept always, what we mean by that is, when the independent variable is zero, how much is the dependent variable? So our y-intercept is saying when the time was zero, what was the position? And so we're looking for the y-intercept at the position that our car had at the start of our motion at t equals zero. So that's just the car's starting position. So we know now that the y-intercept tells us where did the car start, the starting position, the slope tells us both the speed in terms of how steep and the direction in terms of whether the slope is up or down, whether the slope is a positive slope or a negative slope. Now, that slope isn't exactly the same thing as speed. It's very related to speed, but it's actually more than just speed. This is a more meaningful slope than speed. It's the speed and the direction. And since it's not exactly the same idea as speed, I want to give the slope to this graph a different name um, because I'll get sick of saying slope of a position versus time graph over and over and over again if I want to talk about it a lot. And this is an idea, the slope of a position versus time graph is an idea that we're going to find ourselves using a lot. And so we give things names to make it easier to talk about them. So I'm going to give this one the name velocity. So if you ask, hey, what's your definition of velocity? Well, I just told you the slope of a position versus time graph is velocity. So let's come back to our original question that got us started on choosing to do this experiment. We wanted to know, does the toy car move at a steady speed? And I think that we have a definite answer to that right now because we know that the speed is the amount, the absolute value of the slope of this graph. Now, this is the key feature of straight lines. 
is I could measure the slope anywhere. I could pick out any two points on this line and I will calculate the same slope everywhere on this line. So if the slope is the same everywhere, then the speed must be the same everywhere. So if we feel like a straight line is the best representation of the data that we collected, then we must be seeing as far as we can tell that the slope of the graph isn't changing. And if the slope of the graph isn't changing, then the speed isn't changing, the velocity isn't changing. So we do have an answer to that question. As far as we can tell, this car does seem to move at a steady speed. And we know that because we made a line. So the big idea here, if we graph the motion of some object, any object, not just a toy car, but if that graph gives a position versus time graph that's a straight line, then we always have the same slope because that's what straight lines are. And since the slope of that graph is velocity, then straight line position versus time graphs have constant velocities, unchanging velocities. The velocity stays the same. And for that situation, um, when that is true, when we have a straight line position versus time graph, then we would say that we are working with the constant velocity particle model. Constant velocity because velocity is not changing, and it's a particle model because we're not worried about the size or shape of that object. You didn't need to care about the length of the toy car in order to come up with that graph. And it didn't matter because the whole car was moving all together. So we can treat that whole car as though it's just like one blob of stuff where the size and the shape are not important to us. That's what I mean when I talk about a particle model. And a model is just how we are representing the things that we know. And I'll say more about that later. So the constant velocity particle model is our new big idea.